Hey everybody, good hey. evening, good evening. Welcome to the Relationship Q&A segment. This is Couples Academy uh, da Daily Show. And as you know, every single Sunday we come to you with amazing content based upon questions that you've asked throughout the week. And we're excited to be able to answer some of those questions. Absolutely, as always. My name is Asani. I'm Danielle Pettiford. And we're about to get started. But listen, before we do, I, I'm excited because we have a group called the Audacity of Marriage. And as you know, we always like to celebrate couples who are experiencing or having an anniversary. And so listen, we just want to honor uh, this awesome couple. This is Cynthia and her awesome husband. Uh, what, what was the brother's name? I'm trying to find his name. Cynthia and Samuel Adams. They are just celebrating their seven year of marriage. And the key to their success is striving to honor the vows that they established many years ago. So we want to just honor them. And if you have uh, an anniversary, if you are celebrating your love, we want you to join the Audacity Marriage Group. We're going to post it in the group, but we're also going to honor you on our television show. And so we're excited about that because marriage is something that is, it takes hard work. And we need to have a level of commitment and stick to itivism and just respect for the institution of marriage. I think anybody who's in a marriage gets that it's hard work. It's it's the ones that are about to go into marriage that we gotta convince. We all already know. <laughs> <laughs> but it's an investment, and when you invest in your marriage, you will receive a return on your investment. Yes. But we're excited because this year, 2017, is gonna be an amazing year for Couples Academy. We're beginning to travel all over the world. Uh, yeah. People are requesting us in different parts of the, the globe. globe. And we're excited because, listen, we have an amazing marriage conference coming up called To Have and To Hold Marriage Conference. It's going to be in St. Kitts. We want you to register. Get involved. Listen, go to Redeem Promotions. You can find them on Facebook. You can go to their website. You can call the number. We want you to participate in it because it's going to be an amazing experience. And so on Friday night, we're going to be talking to singles. Yeah. And on Saturday, we're going to be doing an amazing marriage conference. And then on Sunday night, we're going to top it off with a cruise. So listen, the, the price is amazing. The location is amazing. We're going to have an awesome time. Mm -hmm. Also, in I think in August, we're going to be going to Johannesburg, South Africa for another marriage conference. So check this video out. We're excited. This is going to be an amazing experience. Now, even though I was just shown, Danielle will be coming with You know, me. they need to add me to the slide <laughs> because I add the blame to this situation. We need to talk to them to have them add a picture of me. Yes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes, we're going to do well, that. Well, one thing that I'm really excited about because we're doing all these um, trips and we're doing all these marriage conferences is that if you know our story, which anytime we come out, anytime we speak anywhere, we tell our story this is a culmination of years and years and years of vision planning and working and hustling and flowing and now all of this stuff is coming into play where we're actually together going out and working together to save marriages so this is humongous that we're actually doing this and it all started with the audacity of marriage that's right now forgive me for my appearance guys I've been traveling today I just got back from Florida I had an amazing weekend with a couple we did a private marriage intensive and just got off the plane jumped in here to to be able to serve you tonight so forgive me for that but listen we have a number of awesome questions that we want to get right to so here we go first question what's the difference between a dating relationship and marriage mm -hmm. now most students have no limits in their relationships in terms of intimacy are there uh, the question is are there certain limits in terms of intimacy awesome question mm -hmm. now I have traveled all over the country speaking on college campuses for the last 10 years and dealing with the topic of sex, sex and dating, sex and relationship, and for some people it's taboo, but I think the more comfortable we get with the topic, the more we can really deal with it. Mm -hmm. I, I, the, the, the reality is, you know, we believe that sex is designed for those that are within the confines of a marriage. That is God's plan for us. And so anything outside of that unit 
it can present a problem. Now, does it mean that your relationship is going to fail? Like, I don't believe in doomsday. I'm not going to say if you have sex, the relationship is over and is doomed to fail. I, I wouldn't say that because we know many people who have engaged in sex and then wound up getting married and had great relationships. But the point is, it's about standards and principles and God's best for you. You know, I could truly say that we waited till we got married to each other before we had sex. And we were glad that we did. So we didn't know each other in a biblical way until we said I do. And <clears throat> excuse me, and to add to that, you know, in this day and age, marriage is it's just different. Like things are shifting. You do have people that are lifelong partners that are living together in a marriage relationship, sharing responsibilities, sharing bills, you know, sharing children, you know, sharing expenses in a home and living in a, a marriage type situation. Legally, the big difference is that, you know, say things don't work out and there's a divorce that needs to take place, you don't get any benefits, you know what I mean? It's like not having insurance. Right. And that sounds kind of, that might sound horrible, but the fact is, is that when you are married and you get divorced, that's where alimony comes in and things of that nature. Marriage, biblical marriage, is the consummation. So, I mean, if, if you're looking at it that way, then if you are in a non-documented legal marriage, that just means you're in a relationship where you've had sex. That's what that is. Now, when you get the documentation from the government, it's not much different than having a 501c3. You can have church all day long, but once you start taking those donations, if you don't have a 501c3, there's no tax write-off. Do you understand? So I think that's the big difference for people today and why even um, why people fight for rights ultimately because it's that's the big thing. They want the right to be married so that they can claim benefits and, and insurance and you know medical, all of those things, and then um, alimony if there's a divorce. Now that's that's from, the big difference. And that's from a legal perspective. Mm -hmm. But from a biblical perspective, we know that you know sex was never meant to initiate a relationship. It was meant to consummate a relationship. And when two people come together, they are then married. And yeah. so God is a part of that union. And, you know, we talk about this all the time. There's something called relationship developmental lag. And, and basically, for instance, according to relationship developmental lag, if you've been in a relationship for, say, a year, okay, and you engaged in sex month two, well, technically, according to this concept, your relationship is only two months old because you immediately jumped into something that wasn't suited for that particular season and now it shifted the relationship so now your your main form of communication your main interaction your main focus now is sex yeah. so the relationship doesn't uh, allow itself the proper amount of time to develop the way that it needs to so you know That's more so about each other's penis vaginas hips thighs That's than so you true. do their their passions their goals their interests that is so true and, and i mean you just got to acknowledge that as truth because you got a whole lot of different opinions on, you know, what makes a relationship real and whether it matters. You know, the millennials, a lot of the millenni millennials, they say they're not interested in getting married. They don't see the point in getting married. They're seeing marriages fail everywhere mm -hmm. they go. It's like, what's the point of marriage for me to tie and bind myself to someone where the odds show statistically that it's not going to work for me? So they say, hey, I'm not going to marry. But when you get down to the nuts and bolts of it, when you put the cart, the cart before the horse, you will find that in your relationship you have a, a, a sex ship and they don't know you. They may That's not right. even like you. That's right. And there's really th this thing where um, even though they say, you know, that whole old saying, like, don't give the cow away. Before, what is it that don't? sell the cow without the milk or whatever. Why, you know, why, why, yeah, why buy like the milk that. without the cow? Whatever. If you look at it from that point of view, there's a lot less vested when you step forward sexually than when you step forward with your mind and your personality and getting to know people. This is why online dating is so successful because people get to actually get to know a person by reading stats and details. They know so much about the person before mm -hmm. they even meet them. And so it's like you've had all six months of worth of information and getting to know somebody online. And so the reality is there are a lot of people today, as you to your point, who don't value marriage. And so I can't tell you how many individuals on television shows, talk shows that I've worked with, and then couples that I've actually counseled who met each other day one, they're moving in month one. Yeah. There's, I mean, they don't even know each other. Now, mm -hmm. statistically, upwards of 72% of all relationships where people have moved in together, uh, those marriages will never take place. 
if they do, it'll mm. be affected by infidelity and will ultimately lead to divorce. So the statistics do not work in your favor. So when sex is removed <laughs> from the relationship, you have more time to really develop, get to know who that person is, okay. develop the right connections, and then you transition into sex once you say it. Yeah, um, Nichelle got it for me. She said, why buy the milk when you can get the cow for free? Thank you. Thank you, Nichelle. I was struggling with that, but you didn't help. <laughs> and hey, Rich, how you doing? Okay, so so so, yeah. so sex is is one of those things that we you know we really believe individuals should honor yeah. and have more of a respect for rather than looking at it as some recreational uh, exercise that you can just do with anyone. And and really this question kind of ties us into the very next question, which is a powerful question. Uh, the question is why is it so hard um, to break an emotional soul tie? Now that comes from. Kimberly in New Jersey. And I think we're kind of talking about it. Now, you have to understand what a soul tie is. For all of those that don't come from a church background, uh, understand that we're trying hey, beings, right? We're spirit, soul, and body. So you are not your body, okay? You are a spiritual being housed in a physical body and you possess a soul. Now, the soul is where the mind, the will, the emotions, the thoughts, the intellect, the imagination reside. So when two people come together and begin to form relationship, there's a connection, there's chemistry. Where? In the area of the soul. We have emotions that are coming together, right? And so the reality is you've heard of the term soul ties, but we've also heard of soul mates. Now, here's the thing, and then Danielle, I want you to weigh in. When two people get married, technically they become soulmates. The Bible talks about leaving and cleaving and becoming one. So there's a oneness in the soul tie. So a soul tie can be good, a soul tie could be bad based upon the dynamics of the relationship. I once heard somebody say, a grape can be used for medicinal purposes. A grape can be used for its nutritional value, but that same grape, given a certain spin and given a certain twist can be used to do great harm. It's not what you use, but how you use what you use and not where you get it from, but what you do with it once you get it. Fire can be used to warm you. Fire can be used for purification, but beyond benefit, it can lead to detriment, even leading to the loss of life. Once again, not what you use, but how you use what you use and not where you get it from, but what you do with it once you get it. So in context of soul ties, soul ties can be good in a covenant relationship and it could be bad in a non-marital relationship because if you break up and now you're all emotionally, sexually connected to that person and move on to the next and haven't had a detox getting that person out of your system, maintaining enough time to be whole and complete within yourself, you're entering into relational menage a trois because you're carrying that past pain from that other partner into your present relationship or that still emotional connection and now your heart is split, your mind is split and you can't give the new person all of who you are. So it's hard to break because you're, you're, you're involving yourself in things that are premature for the nature of that relationship. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you said it all. P pretty much this is why you have people that um, you know, they struggle with being alone because they've been with the last person. They have this broken heart feeling. They, they're devastated. They can't move on. They don't understand why this person has gone and left them. You really get a little psychotic about it because it's like tearing two people apart. I once saw, um, actually it was my kid's youth pastor who did this, where he explained soul ties like, you know, he, grew, he glued two popsicle sticks together. Mm -hmm. And he basically um, tried to break them apart. And when he tried to break them apart, they broke and just tore the heck up. Wow. And that's and it was really a powerful demonstration for kids to see because he was talking about why you should not engage in sex, mm. as, in premarital sex as a teen and all that. And um, it was a really powerful demonstration. But, yeah, you're broken. Mm. You're broken. And then you take all your broken pieces in a bag and you drag it to the next person. And this is where you have mm. the, um, what is that relationship that follows the relationship that follows right after a really hard breakup. Oh, the rebound relationship? The rebound yeah. relationship. That is why you have the yeah. rebound relationship. You just got to cling on to somebody. You're trying to get that one person to glue all your pieces back together. Mm. And you're a disaster. And now they're dealing with your disaster. And then that fails. So it's really powerful uh, what happens when you connect with somebody and you fall in love. And I don't necessarily know if it happens every time. It seems like it's certain relationships where you get connected. I mean, there's going to be a soul tie. But I don't think that it's as devastating every time as it is with some relationships where you break apart and you are just 
jacked up. Well, obviously, the more invested you are mm-hmm. in that relationship, yeah. your mind, your heart, your spirit, your, all of that, it's harder to break away. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I will say that if you're just having casual sex with multiple people, there's a soul tie. Oh, yeah. I mean, we know oh, that yeah. spirits transfer through touch. Mm-hmm. In fact, there was a study done on, on uh, prostitutes. And they were saying that there's a high percentage of prostitutes who suffer from schizophrenia. They have multiple personalities because they've been involved with so many different people. Yeah. So I, you know, I want you to understand that whether it's some short-term relationship, some one-night stand, some long-term relationship, there's a residual effect of everybody that you connect with, and that's why it's so difficult to break a soul tie. And last point, because I never heard that that example you gave, but mm-hmm. that's a powerful example. Mm-hmm. I always was given the example if you take if you take gum, chew gum and stick it into the carpet long enough Mm. and then try to pull the gum out of the carpet there are going to be fabrics of the carpet that are stuck in the gum Mm -hmm. and pieces of the gum that's now stuck in the fabric of the carpet and so when two become one it's almost like sticking gum into carpet so when you break up because it's not a marriage relationship there is a ripping and tearing apart and pieces of you are left with the other person and pieces of that other person are left with you. Yeah. And so it's all about collecting those pieces and allowing, you know, God to really heal you yeah. and make you whole in order to move forward. Now, hold on. Do we have questions for uh, time for live questions? We absolutely okay. have Okay, so let me take this live question from, uh, well, I won't give the name. I don't know if she wants to give a name. Well, they're, they're on Oh, it's already there. <laughs> Great. All right, Brooke Kelly, do you suggest a couple who is who is struggling for some time with communication, marry two years, eliminate sex for a while, and learn to get intimate in other ways? A married couple? Uh, um, first of all, in terms of uh, eliminating sex, the Bible clearly states that uh, if sex is removed from the relationship, it has to be agreed upon by both partners. Mm-hmm. Because when we did you see how one, serious he got when when I, that was said? I, I've I, never. I, what have, have I done anything? I'm saying no. Okay. I, no I'm not saying. I saw the eye. My God. I'm just simply saying. Sex is a major part of a relationship. And so, unfortunately, a lot of people use sex as a tool of manipulation. They use it as control. And for many people, like the bedroom has become a, you know, or the bed has become a bartering table uh, in terms of which transactions are made. And so women know that men generally desire it and they'll hold on to it as a way of punishing and yeah. sometimes that may work I don't know depending upon the relationship sometimes it, it doesn't or sometimes it can backfire it really can because backfire. there are plenty of women out there that are ready to go I just want to real quick acknowledge Devana hey St. Kitts is in the house I want to say hi to Jenny King thank you for joining me sister my husband just gave me the side eye okay <laughs> <laughs> um, and I want to say um, as it relates to her question that if you are not married um, because there might be some people on here that are not married. Like we did not co- have sex until we got married, right. but we were sexually active before we got With married. Other people, yeah. Right. And so my point is, is that that allowed us to get to know each other on a very, very intimate level. We became yeah. best friends, and there was nothing that could separate us. And so for us to go and get married then and consummate our marriage, it was just like really solidifying the bond. So I wouldn't say that if you are married that you should, unless Hassani is right, unless you both say, you know, we don't have intimacy and we think that the solution here is to abstain from sex for a while and then we're going to learn other ways to be intimate. But if you are the initiator of abstaining because you feel like you are not receiving the intimate that you need, then you have to to do a different direction. Now, I want to balance that because I work with lots of couples, okay, and usually uh, it's a result of infidelity, but whatever the area of conflict, compromise, or, co- or, or crisis may be, uh, sex sometimes is halted for couples to participate in, in conversations because you can get somebody's attention when... So what I'm saying is I don't want you using it as a tool. Like I think it's a conversation you two need to have together and say, yeah. listen, l- w- listen, let's get our relationship back on track. Let's put sex aside. Let us agree on that for, for a specific period of time so that we can begin to focus because what happens is a lot of women in particular will still continue to give their husband sex and I know couples who have sex every day every other day and they're miserable they're suffering the touch that will once stimulate now is a touch that turns them off and repulses them but they're doing it because they feel obligated to do it but it's drawing them emotionally further and further yeah, apart that would be so crazy. the man the man's compensated but right. the woman is miserable and it just makes for a horrible horrible situation so listen if you're in that situation and you're in crisis I would highly recommend getting counsel like get outside expertise and advice 
and professional, you know, uh, individuals who can help you with your issue. Yeah. Hey, we have another question. Um, it's from Christina Cortez. I have been with a man for seven years and have yet to meet his family. We do not live together. Mm. Is it time to move on? Marriage is not in the near future. I, listen, I'm going to start with this because I've been on television shows where I've peaked people's game and I've had counseling sessions for extended periods of time with couples in the same scenario. Yeah. Now, I can't speak about your man and your relationship, but in every single relationship that I've worked with, he was leaving a double life. He had another wife, he had family, he had children. For somebody to be with you for that period of time and there is no interaction, no involvement with anyone outside of him, friends, family, you don't go, you don't date, you don't go out into the public, you're being played. Mm. That That's just my humble opinion because that's how I've seen it turn out mm -hmm. countless times. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree and um, you know, I, I feel like I would love to talk a little bit more to you, Christina, because you know, the other part of it is maybe why have you let it go for so long? Yeah, that's I mean, a good seven question. Seven years is a long time to invest your life, your time, your love into somebody, and you have yet to meet a family member, unless he is an un undercover CIA agent or 90 years old and the only one left in his family. <laughs> There's something wrong with that. When you marry somebody, you're marrying their past, their present, mm -hmm. their future. When you marry somebody, you're marrying their family in essence because guess what? We all have a family marinade. Sometimes you can really get to know who the person is that you're dating by meeting their family yeah. and their friends because we're a product of our environment. So if you've been isolated and excluded from all things concerning his personal life, there's a problem. Then I want to know, well, what about your communication? Do you have access to each other's cell phones, each other's emails, each other's social media? Are you completely blocked out of every aspect of his life? Yeah. If so, that's a huge, huge warning sign. Mm -hmm. And if marriage is nowhere in the near future, what are you doing? Mm -hmm. And why are you doing it? That's out of love. Yeah, yeah, for real. Okay, we have another question from my lovely Jenny King. So I have been with my husband for 15 years, and since the birth of our little of our little there has been a distinct tension because of my focus on her what mm. are your thoughts on keeping the marriage strong still hold on uh, I had to scroll down giving your child your children what they need to build self-esteem and to feel supported and loved well I mean when when we had little children I was probably extremely guilty of this mm -hmm. um, Hassani traveled a lot and I really did build my whole world and my whole life around the kids it was all about them they got all the kisses they got all the touch they got all the hugs they got all the affection and I was getting the side eye hardcore from Hassani all the time and I'm like what is wrong with mm -hmm. him is he insane well later on I discovered that this is a thing this is a real thing where husbands feel neglected and ignored because the wives are giving all this attention to the children and have forgotten about them. I mean, my God, first the baby comes out, then they're sucking on your breast. Then you go from them, they go to a bottle, then now you're cuddling them, hugging them, rubbing on them. You're giving them all this attention and they're left on the sidelines. So, I mean, it really just is about balance. You know, for, for Hassani and I, the affection thing has always been something that was an issue on the table. I'm not the affectionate one. He is. He's the one that wants the hugs and the kisses and the touches. I'm really good with a pat. How you doing? You know, as a matter of fact, I prefer my hugs that way. Pat me on the back. You don't need to rub me, <laughs> you know. And so really what we've had to do is balance that and actually schedule time for intimacy. It sounds like it's not romantic. I felt like it wasn't romantic in the in the beginning trying to schedule these things. But actually it relieves that tension. That tension where you feel like you're trying to avoid the person all the time because you know you haven't you know, given them their love language, you haven't touched them in a while, and you really just don't feel like it, and you've got 800 other things to do. When things are scheduled, it relieves the tension. Everybody knows when it's going down, you do too, and you can set your mind and priorities according to that calendar. Excellent response. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm just gonna simply say, you know, one of the marital patterns that cause conflict, possible divorce, possible infidelity, and all types of issues is what we call the child-centered relationship. In this particular dynamic, we get married, she has on her wife hat, I have on my husband hat, but as soon as the kids come out, we take off those hats and put on a mommy and daddy hat. So the, as she said, the love we give each other, we now give to the child. The time we used to give each other, we give to the child. The resources we used to give to each other, we now give to the child. And now the, now, 
over time, I don't know her anymore. <laughs> By the time that child is 16, 17, 18 years old and they get out, we're strangers living in the same household because yeah. there was no connection whatsoever. We were co-parenting but had no relationship. So the principle that we believe in with Couples Academy is partners first, parents second. Yeah. Why? Because you came before your children. So that should be the order and the structure of the household. It's God, it's Christ, it's man, it's the woman, it's the children. So this partnership is the primary relationship. Yeah. All things are secondary. Yeah. Now, last point. The children may get the quantity of time, obviously, but as long as there's quality time right. between us, that's really all that really matters, where we feel prioritized. Mm -hmm. And when that's in place, I think you can resolve that issue. And last point on that that just popped in my head is it's really important for your kids also to know the prior, the order in the house. You know, they should not feel like they go before dad. They should know, okay, it's da mommy, daddy, and then us. They really should know that and respect those boundaries so that now there is no divide between you and your spouse. Excellent. Any other questions? Yes. Um, wow, this is good. I know. Keep, I mean, we have prepared questions, but I'd rather go to the live questions and start off with the prepared questions in our next session. So keep them coming. You're welcome, Jay. Um, okay, so hmm, that wasn't really a question. Okay. Many ladies have been with guys for four years, five and more, and not seeing marriage in the near future from the guy she dating. Okay. Mm -hmm. But I think men need to understand when a wife has so many other things on their mind. I think that might be two statements. I don't know if that was a question or not. What do you think she's saying? I think what she's saying is, um, you know, that women are dating men and they are not seeing marriage in the near future. And this is very true. Um, I know this, this is a major um, issue for my girlfriends here on the ground in Georgia and in New Jersey who are single. Um, they struggle to find men at this age, I mean, in the 40-ish range, mm -hmm. that are willing to commit, willing to settle down. There's no commitment anywhere in the near future, no conversation about it. It's not like when we were dating where you're like you're a year in and the conversation is happening. It's like, okay, where are we going here? Right. You know, the older you get, it seems like that conversation is taboo and kind of like illegal to have with these men. I don't know. I mean, what do you say about it? Well, what I have found is that uh, women have a different concept of time than men. Why? Because you have a biological clock. Thank so you, Brooke. She said it was a statement. Go ahead. Oh, okay. Yeah. You have this biological clock, right? So you're thinking, okay, I want children by a certain age. I want to be married by a certain age. I want family. I want all these things, different things. And so you get caught up in a relationship that uh, gotcha. it goes beyond uh, where it should, holding on to the hope that one day he'll get himself together and then eventually he'll wind up you know, falling in love with you and then you'll wind up getting married. Mm -hmm. I think that's problematic. I'm not saying that you should put a time clock on people, but I am saying that you need to realize where you're stuck. We talk about the four seasons of a successful relationship all the time. Dating season, committed courtship, engagement, and marriage. So the question becomes, what season are you in? And how long have you been in that season? A season shouldn't last forever. You can prolong seasons, you can shorten seasons, if you look at a fruit, right? If you pick a fruit from a tree too soon, it's not ripe. You bite into it, it's raw and bitter, doesn't taste good. However, if you pick that fruit too late, now it's spoiled, it's corroded, you got worms in it, it's brown, it's disgusting. So it's all about proper timing. You know, if there are four seasons to a successful relationship, in my humble opinion, not that I believe in strict guidelines, yeah. but a relationship should be, you know, you should be with somebody at least a year, there's four seasons in a year in order to begin having real conversations about the possibility of marriage. And, I mean, you know what, to balance that though, because um, I find that people who are online dating are getting married way faster. Like six to eight months is not uncommon for me to hear online dating. Well, let me tell you, I have a problem with that though. Mm -hmm. For instance, whether it's online dating or people of a certain age, like once I hit my 30s, my 40s, my 50s, I already know what I want. I ain't wasting my time with trying to, you know, be with somebody for too long. I want to get married. Mm -hmm. So people go from hi, my name is to I do. And that's a problem mm -hmm. because once again, the relationship developmental lag, you haven't had enough time to get to know who that person is. Mm -hmm. I know people who have had bi-coastal relationships and there's nothing wrong with that either. However, there are elements of a bi-coastal relationship that are missing than if you two were physically together. Yeah. And so what happens is because we're apart, you know, one part of the country, we want to get together, let's move in, let's get married and boom, we have it. And then a couple months later, you're like, I'm not, you're not the person that I thought 
I knew. Like I didn't. I don't really know you. Now you enter into another form of crisis. So I don't believe in putting strict guidelines. It's got to be this long or this short. But you, you you have to take time to properly develop yeah. the relationship you're in. I agree. No more questions. All right. Well, we have time for one more question before we. This is a deep one. Uh, let's put it on the screen. My husband, okay, was recently caught in adultery. Um, how do I bring myself to having sex with him again? I still compare myself and wonder if he's thinking of me or the other woman. And that's from Sarah from Botswana. Botswana obviously is in Africa. Deep question, very good question. Let me just say that I, you know, 97% of my clients um, are impacted by infidelity. That's primarily uh, what I work with. And so in this particular situation, it's important to understand that for many people, cheating and infidelity is not necessarily about the sex. It, it, so if it's about the sex, more likely you're dealing with somebody who's having a one night stand or someone who is involved in sexual compulsion and they have a desire that they can't control, their wife can't fulfill them and they go out seeking sex everywhere they go. But most people who are in uh, uh, an affair for a few months to a few years, it's more of an emotional connection. And so all the research will tell you is more about desire than it is sex. Now sex naturally occurs in that type of close relationship where there is intimacy and a soul tie. But they're not initially, see I say this all the time, infidelity doesn't begin in the bedroom, it ends in the bedroom. So there's a gradual process till it leads to sex. And unfortunately a lot of um, hurt spouses who are going through this have a tendency of comparing themselves to this phantom woman. They don't always know what that woman looks like. They don't know who she is because that's not revealed or even if that person is revealed. Now it's about am I performing the way she's performing and what is she doing better than I? And most of uh, uh, people who are in the affair will tell you that it's really not about the sex. Mm. It's about the relationship. It's about the connection. It's about the fact that we connect and communicate in ways and sex is a part of that equation. Now that doesn't make it any easier if you're struggling with that in your mind. And so in that particular situation, I highly recommend that you get counseling. You know, even with the best of intentions that you may have and your spouse may have to reconcile, you know, you've heard the expression before, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. So we may not know enough. We don't have enough knowledge, wisdom, skill, know-how to overcome this major hurdle. And couples who attempt to do it on their own, usually they're dealing with the residue of that affair for, their, for, for, for a long period of time within their marriage. But statistically, those who seek help, professional help, usually within a two-year period, find healing, find restoration uh, within that family structure. So I highly recommend that you, you seek somebody. Now, as you know, Couples Academy, we're committed to uh, divorce prevention and infidelity recovery. So I encourage you to reach out to us. Let's have a conversation. And for all of those here, we want to let you know uh, that you are entitled to a 30-minute uh, session with us. You're entitled to have that because we're committed to giving you what you need for your particular relationship. And so I hope that kind of answers your question. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> And, and, and helps you through. Um, but listen, these were great questions. Oh yeah, I, I, we love the questions coming through. Keep them coming. When you send them in, we'll, it, we'll have them prepared as a slide yeah. or you can ask them live. So this was really great. Listen, I hope you learned something today. We want you to share before we close, share this, put this on your wall because there's so many people who are in need of help and you may be the very thing uh, that they need. You're the vessel, you're the conduit, you're the instrument, you're the one that's gonna help them get where they need to go. So we wanna let you know that we love you and we will see you on next week. See you soon. Good night. Bye.